Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. God is good. All the time. Let us pray. Let us be still and know that we are not God. Let us be aware of God's continuing and compassionate presence. Let us be sensitive to our particular strengths and weaknesses. Let us be open to new faces, new ideas, new ways. Let us be quiet long enough to hear God's voice and long enough to hear our neighbors cry. Let us be fair. Let us be friendly. Let us be faithful. And finally, let us be adults in the world and yet still always children of God. May I speak in the name of the living God. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, saints. Good morning. What a joy it is to be with you this morning in this place, in this time. You are in the hood. <laughs> and you are purposely in the hood. For on this weekend, we make a journey from the hood to the hill and back again. It is a joy to be here with you in this great getting up morning. Thank you. We thank God for this time together. It is good to be here on the eve of all saints, giving thanks for the ministry of the 26th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Catherine Jefford Shorey, on her last day in office. And it is good to be here on the eve of the installation of the 27th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Bruce Curry. <laughs> Gathered together at this Eucharistic vigil of reflection and hope, Thank you, Bishop Curry, for your kind invitation to preach today. Thank you, National Union of Black Episcopalians, for providing a venue in which the body of Christ gathered may worship the living God in the hood, in the armory where people are trained, raised up, and taught how to go out and defend us in days of peril, a place of training, of life. The, last, the first time we came here, to look at this venue, there were horses riding in this place. So if you smell a little bit of that manure, but you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, began his life in a place with manure, didn't he? Amen. And so in some ways, we build a bridge all the way back around to life together. Thanks to all of you who have made major contributions to this day. Thanks to those of you who have given to us in any way. Thanks to those of you who got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to come down here today. Thanks. I know y'all are not yet awake, but we're going to try to wake you up. Thanks as well to the team of people, the board of National Board of the UBE, and the team of planning this event to transform this armory into a church today. Months and months of hard work, many moving parts. Thank you, team. We got here. We're grateful to Almighty God for making this day possible. And it is delightful for me to note today that the church, for once, is not following the world. As remember tonight, in the United States, your clocks are being turned back, but tonight 
At 1201, our church is going forward. Kronos says, go back. Kairos says, move forward in the fullness of time, in God's own time. And so on this eve of all saints, all hallowed eve, on this historic occasion, we are reminded that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of the ancestors, those who have gone before us, those who have borne the weight of the struggle and the heat of the day. Some were famous, and others' names will never be known. But they are all important to God and to us. We remember today the many ways in which their faith, their struggle, their hope, and their belief in a better way of life for those who would come after them sustained them, strengthened them, and inspire us. These ancestors we remember today include Bishop and Mrs. Curry's parents, Father Kenneth Curry, Dorothy Ada Strayhorn Curry, Mabel Robinson Clement, Troy Rufus Clement, Frank Jones, and all other Curry's and Strayhorn family members who stand on that all too distant shore. We remember also Bishops John Burgess, John Walker, Walter DeCosta Dennis, E. Don Taylor, Quentin Primo, Franklin Turner, Jay Walker, the Reverends Charles Smith, Michael Moret, Jimmy Woodruff, Waylon Melton, Paulie Murray, and Sister Althea Augustine. Why don't you take a moment now and yell out the saints you remember. List, lift their names up now. She's not dead. <laughs> I forgot my mic was on. In Hebrews, we read, Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Let me break that down for you a minute. These ancestors, these giants in the faith, without us, will never rest in peace. They have done their work, but if we do not do our work, they will never rest in peace. And so as Bishop Curry has reminded me in a meditative poem, this one is for the ancestors. Those who came before, those who labored through a hard and bitter bondage, who toiled through unspeakable uncertainty and lived in the midst of harrowing hopelessness, and yet who learned the way of Jesus and believed against belief and hoped against hope that soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. Soon evil will cease from troubling and soon the weary will find their rest. And if, dear friends, this is for the ancestors, we are reminded that a torch has been passed to a new generation, a generation that includes the greatest generation, the baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, which we call the millennials, and something I learned last night, Generation Z, which we call the boomlets. Those ancestors have done their work, and they leave this church and this society in our hands to do the work that God has given us to do. Carl Daw said it well when he penned the words of a wonderful song. He writes, till all the jails are empty and all the bellies full, till no one hurts or steals or lies and no more blood is spilled. 
God has work for us to do. God has work for us to do. Believe in the promise, I make all things new. God has work for us to do. Till age and race and gender no longer separate, till pulpit, press, and politics are freed of greed and hate, in tenement and mansion, in factory, farm, and mill, in boardroom and in billiard hall, in wards where time stands still, in classroom, church, and office, in shops and on the street, in every place where people thrive or starve or hide or meet. By sitting at a bedside to hold pale trembling hands, by speaking for the powerless against unjust demands, by praying through our doing and singing through our fear, by trusting that the seed we sow will bring God's harvest near, God has work, work for us to do. This is our work, dear friends. Bishop Michael, the seed sower, the fire starter in our spirits with the Holy Spirit, the hope peddler is calling us to the Jesus movement. And ever since his election, I've had many people come to challenge me about the meaning of the movement. Some are concerned that we must be more than social workers in communities. Others worry that the movement takes us away from the institution. But friends, what is a movement? A movement is something that exists to change people's lives. It moves, it grows, it expands, it challenges the status quo, it causes revolutions. I know y'all don't want to hear that. It causes revolutions. It upsets people in power. It turns over tables and it turns lives around. As people of the way, we are part of the movement. Institution is what happens to a movement when it grows up. It creates the structure, it has meetings, it funds the structure, it exists to maintain order, it exists to perpetuate itself, it sometimes resists change, and it is totally predictable. We have become the institution, and we live in the institution, but we are being called forward into the Jesus movement so that we exist to love as Jesus loved, to change people's lives, moving, growing, expanding, challenging the status quo, causing revolutions, being unafraid of change, realizing at the heart of every revolution is human kindness, turning tables upside down and turning lives around. On November 4th, 2008, when President Barack Obama was elected, many of the people who voted for him stood outside with tears streaming down their faces, filled with joy, believing that the nation would change overnight because of his election. We were naive then, weren't we? People were filled with hope that he would be the new Messiah to lead us to the promised land and certainly to reform this nation into a place of liberty and justice for all. Soon after the election, President Obama invited all of us to get up off our duffs and get to the work of transforming this society. And then while in office, of course, from time to time, he made decisions with which people disagreed and suddenly he wasn't quite as popular as he was on November 4th, 2008, out there in the rain. And people said, we didn't elect you to ask us to do any work. We elected you to do the work. My dear friends, God has work for us to do as we bear Christ in this world. No leader can do it alone. No leader can do it alone. The ancestors started the work for us. The baton has been passed 
to us. They without us will not rest in peace. So then on March 13, 2013, Argentine Cardinal Bergoglio was elected the 266th Pope. Many were excited about his election, believing that his option for the poor and his deep commitment to climate change and justice meant that he could and would change existing stances and structures in the Roman Catholic Church. In our euphoria about his election in good spirit, many were surprised when the Pope looked around like Jesus did on that mountain in the feeding of the 5,000. And the Pope looked at us and said, you know, there are millions of hungry people out there in this world. You feed them. You sacrifice so that we have a healthy climate to leave to generations yet unborn. You be Jesus' hands and feet and heart in the world. And of course, in the course of time and his time in office, there are decisions he's made and will make which, with which we'll disagree, and people will find his popularity rating going down. What does he care about that? What are they going to do, stop him from being the Pope? <laughs> he's calling us to a place in that Jesus movement of peace and justice and forgiveness. No leader can do it alone. The ancestors started the work for us. The torch has been passed to us. You know what the next line is. They, say it with me, they without us will not rest in peace. And then on uh, that great getting up morning in Salt Lake City, on June 27, 2015, when Bishop Michael Curry was elected, many were euphoric. More selfies were taken with him. <laughs> no, you got to get my, my real line for this. More selfies were taken with him, a smiling bishop sharing his joyful witness. Shall we try this again? A smiling bishop sharing his joyful witness. More selfies were taken with him than anyone could imagine. But you know, we think we invented selfies, friends. The first real selfie was the one on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter begged Jesus to stay on that mountain. And Jesus said, no, we can't do this. We can't keep things exactly as they were. He told them that they could not stay in that place. They had to leave the mountaintop to go down to the places of ministry and change and life and people. Now, you know, there are two problems with selfies. If you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember this. There are two problems with selfies. The first is that they are a freeze frame in time. They capture the present moment for all of time. And we believe every time we look at that picture that we're back at that happy moment in time. The second problem is that they sometimes engender confusion about who has what role. You see, sometimes we're convinced that if we are in the selfie with someone else, we become that other person, and we know better than they do how to do their job. Y'all with me? So you see, Bishop Michael is elected, and he has invited us to get up off our duffs and do the work of transformation and reconciliation and forgiveness called for in the Jesus movement. He invites us to gather up all the fragments of our frayed humanity, that none be lost and that none be left out. He invites us to live into and become the love of Jesus in a world desperate to know and feel that love. He invites us as Episcopalians to sing out, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is inviting us, friends, into a love fest of discomfort because we can't choose who Jesus will give us to know and to love as companions on the way. The more he calls us to work in the vineyard of this movement, 
the less time and energy we will have to gossip anything but the good news of the gospel. The more he calls us to this work, the less time we will have to second guess why someone else does what they do. Friends, let our new selfies be of each of us and the work of transformation and bearing Jesus Christ into the world. Let our selfies be of our engaging the real adaptive change rather than finding technical solutions to problems before us. Put those selfies up beside our selfies with Bishop Michael, and then both of those photos will come alive, I promise you. There will be days when we are convinced that, of course, we know better than the new presiding bishop. There'll be days that we are convinced, uh, you know, in the course of his work, that he's making decisions counter to the decisions we would make if we were in his shoes. But that is the nature of leadership. And I'd like to invite you today to make a covenant to pray for him and not to pray upon him. <laughs> when you are most disturbed or angry over these next nine years, I want you to remember the importance of getting things done ASAP always say a prayer. When you are most disturbed or angry over these next nine years, remember the importance of push. Pray until something happens. Pray with him and find ways to communicate with him and with each other that are joyful, generative, and life-giving. No leader can do it alone. Jesus did not do it alone. He does not believe in anyone doing silo work alone, and he is a collaborative leader. Friends, the ancestors started this collaborative work for us. The baton has been passed to us, and they, without us, will not rest in peace. Langston Hughes has written a poem entitled, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Bishop Michael, I know the movement of the river and its history in our lives as a people intrigues you. I want to invite you today, as we sang, Shall We Gather at the River? I want to invite you in this new ministry to walk over the river rocks and to stand in the middle of the river. For it is only in the middle of the river that you can reach both sides of the shore. And it is on the shores of the river that many have stood for generations, staring with enmity at one another because they disagree. Theologically, socially, historically, for many other reasons, including that they just plain don't like each other. They also look at each other with great enmity because they have different worldviews. The joy and challenge of your work can be found in the words of the most reverend Helder Kamara, the retired Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Olinda and Recife. He writes about himself, the bishop belongs to all. Let no one be scandalized if I frequent those who are considered unworthy or sinful. For who is not a sinner? Let no one bind me to a group. My door, my heart must be open to everyone. Absolutely 
everyone. And you see, if indeed that is true, Bishop Michael, you and only you, earning the trust as one who shares the love of Jesus, will be able to invite all the disparate parties to travel over the river rocks until they come to the bridge made by the sturdy, strong backs of the ancestors. Your invitation and your willingness to be for everyone in the Jesus movement, we hope, will bring folks from both sides of the shore to meet in that central place in the river so that we can gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river of renewal, relationship, reconciliation, resurrection, and ultimately new life for all of us. You know righteous anger has its place, but it must ultimately lead to that place of reconciliation, reflection, and relationship. Jesus made us to be in relationship with one another. We can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. For all of us created in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, are brothers and sisters with one another. And the same blood flows through our veins. And we live with the same hopes, the same dreams. We just get there in different ways. And you see, Bishop Michael, once folks get onto that bridge, please remind them that there has been a table set in the wilderness and that there is a seat at that table for everyone. And remember, dear friends, that when Jesus calls us to dine with each other, the proverbial place cards that identify where we sit are permanently attached to the table. So we cannot run around and change the place cards to only sit with our friends. <laughs> we are invited intentionally in the Jesus movement to come to know those that we might least like to know, to remember that we are all in this together brothers and sisters, children of the living God. And if you don't show up for the meal that Jesus has invited us to, life will never forgive you for it. And now finally, friends, don't you love that word, finally? <laughs> finally, Gloria Wade Gales, a professor at Spelman and Morehouse Colleges, wrote a memoir called Push Back to Strength. In the first chapter, she is speaking with her grandmother and is animatedly telling her about her life in the world. She says, Grandma, it seems like every time I stand up, I get pushed down. She says, Grandma, it seems like every time I try to go forward, I get pushed back. Grandma, do you hear me? Her grandmother, wise beyond knowing, looked up from her sewing and said, Well, child, when they push you back, they are pushing you back to strength. They are pushing you back to us where you can get strong again. So do not be afraid because they are pushing you back to us. Bishop Michael, there will be days when I am sure that you, like Gloria, would like to ask your grandmother about why. And she may indeed answer you from heaven. And on those days, as you know so clearly the Jesus of your faith and history, as you know that the God behind us is greater than any problem ahead of us, know also that you are being pushed back to the ancestors who made it possible for us to be here today. Push back to strength so that you can get strong again and come into our midst and challenge us to have the moral courage to be strong in this work that God has given us to do. And so for the ancestors, soon love will win. Soon justice, soon forgiveness, soon goodness, soon kindness, soon a new heaven and a new earth. For all soon glory glory. This one is for the ancestors. So come what may, to God be the glory. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. 
So lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, because this one is for the ancestors. For if we are able to do this together, if we are willing to recognize that since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we can also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and we can run with perseverance the race that is set before us, lacing up our converses and looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So come to me, all you who tra travail under heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of it, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls for a minute. <laughs> and once we rest, we got to get up because we got work to do. Once we do this work, dear friends, once we do this work consistently, once we do this work with joy, all those ancestors, all those saints for whom we give thanks, all those saints named and unnamed, in these days, if we are doing our work, all those folks who are shouting hallelujah in heaven today will finally be able to rest in And let the church say amen, let the church